Second part of chapter four of the first volume of the Life of Reason. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Fredrik Karlsson. The Life of Reason by George Santayana. Side note. Kant's substitute for knowledge. Kant, like Berkeley, had a private mysticism in reserve to raise upon the ruins of science and common sense. Knowledge was to be removed to make way for faith. This task is ambiguous, and the equivocation involved in it is perhaps the deepest of those confusions with which German metaphysics has since struggled, and which have made it waver between the deepest introspection and the dreariest mythology. To substitute faith for knowledge might mean to teach the intellect humility, to make it aware of its theoretic and transitive function as a faculty for hypothesis and rational fiction, building a bridge of methodical inferences and ideal unities between fact and fact, between endeavor and satisfaction, it might be to remind us, sprinkling over us, as it were, the Lenten ashes of an intellectual contrition, that our thoughts are air, even as our bodies are dust, momentary vehicles and products of an immortal vitality in God and in nature, which fosters and illumines us for a moment before it lapses into other forms. Had Kant proposed to humble and concentrate into a practical faith the same natural ideas which had previously been taken for absolute knowledge, his intention would have been innocent, his conclusions wise, and his analysis free from venom and arrière pensée. Man, because of his finite and propulsive nature, and because he is a pilgrim and a traveller throughout his life, is obliged to have faith. The absent, the hidden, the eventual, is the necessary object of his concern. But what else shall his faith rest in, except in what the necessary forms of his perception present to him, and what the indispensable categories of his understanding help him to conceive? What possible objects are there for faith, except objects of a possible experience. What else should a practical and moral philosophy concern itself with except the governance and betterment of the real world? It is surely by using his only possible forms of perception and his inevitable categories of understanding that man may yet learn, as he has partly learned already, to live and prosper in the universe. Had Kant's criticism amounted simply to such a confession of the tentative, practical, and hypothetical nature of human reason, it would have been wholly acceptable to the wise, and its appeal to faith would have been nothing but an expression of natural vitality and courage, just as its criticism of knowledge would have been nothing but a better acquaintance with self. This faith would have called the forces of impulse and passion to reason's support, not to its betrayal. Faith would have meant faith in the intellect, a faith naturally expressing man's practical and ideal nature and the only faith yet sanctioned by its fruits. Side note. False subjectivity attributed to reason. Side by side with this reinstatement of reason, however, which was not absent from Kant's system in its critical phase and in its application to science, there lurked in his substitution of faith for knowledge another and sinister intention. He wished to blast as insignificant, because subjective, the whole structure of human intelligence with all the lessons of experience and all the triumphs of human skill, and to attach 
absolute validity instead to certain echoes of his rigoristic religious education these notions were surely just as subjective and far more local and transitory than the common machinery of thought and it was actually proclaimed to be an evidence of their sublimity that they remained entirely without practical sanction in the form of success or of happiness the categorical imperative was a shadow of the ten commandments the postulates of practical reason were the minimal tenets of the most abstract protestantism these fossils found unaccountably embedded in the old man's mind he regarded as the evidences of an inward but supernatural revelation side note chimerical reconstruction only the quaint severity of kant's education and character can make intelligible to us the restraint he exercised in making supernatural postulates all he asserted was his inscrutable moral imperative and a god to reward with the pleasures of the next world those who had been puritans in this but the same principle could obviously be applied to other cherished imaginations there is no superstition which it might not justify in the eyes of men accustomed to see in that superstition the sanction of their morality for the practical proofs of freedom immortality and providence of which all evidence in reason or experience had previously been denied exceed in perfunctory sophistry anything that can be imagined yet this lamentable epilogue was in truth the guiding thought of the whole investigation nature had been proved a figment of human imagination so that once rid of all but a mock allegiance to her fact and laws we might be free to invent any world we choose and believe it to be absolutely real and independent of our nature strange prepossession that while part of human life and mind was to be an avenue to reality and to put men in relation to external and eternal things the whole of human life and mind should not be able to do so conceptions rooted in the very elements of our being in our senses intellect and imagination which had shaped themselves through many generations under a constant fire of observation and dissolution these were to be called subjective not only in the sense in which all knowledge must obviously be so since it is knowledge that someone possesses and has gained but subjective in a disparaging sense and in contrast to some better form of knowledge but what better form of knowledge is this if it be a knowledge of things as they really are and not as they appear we must remember that reality means what the intellect infers from the data of sense and yet the principles of such inference by which the distinction between appearance and reality is first instituted are precisely the principles now to be discarded as subjective and of merely empirical validity merely empirical is a vicious phrase what is other than empirical is less than empirical and what is not relative to eventual experience is something given only in present fancy the gods of genuine religion for instance are terms in a continual experience the pure in heart may see god if the better and less subjective principle be said to be the moral law we must remember that the moral law which has practical importance and true dignity deals with facts and forces of the natural world that it expresses interests and aspirations in which man's fate in time and space with his pains 
pleasures and all other empirical feelings is concerned. This was not the moral law to which Kant appealed, for this is a part of the warp and woof of nature. His moral law was a personal superstition, irrelevant to the impulse and need of the world. His notions of the supernatural were those of his sect and generation, and did not pass to his more influential disciples. What was transmitted was simply the contempt for sense and understanding and the practice, authorized by his modest example, of building air castles in the great clearing which the critic was supposed to have made. It is noticeable in the series of philosophers from Hobbes to Kant that as the metaphysical residuum diminished the critical and psychological machinery increased in volume and value. In Hobbes and Locke, with the beginnings of empirical psychology, there is mixed an abstract materialism. In Berkeley, with an extension of analytic criticism, a popular and childlike theology, entirely without rational development, in Hume, with a completed survey of human habits of ideation, a withdrawal into practical conventions, and in Kant, with the conception of the creative understanding firmly grasped and elaborately worked out, a flight from the natural world altogether. Side note: The Critique, A Word on Mental Architecture The Critique, in spite of some artificialities and pedantries in arrangement, presented a conception never before attained of the rich architecture of reason. It revealed the intricate organization comparable to that of the body, possessed by that fine web of intentions and counter-intentions whose pulsations are our thoughts. The dynamic logic of intelligence was laid bare, and the hierarchy of ideas, if not always correctly traced, was at least manifested in its principle. It was as great an enlargement of Hume's work as Hume's had been of Locke's or Locke's of Hobbes. And the very fact that the metaphysical residuum practically disappeared for the weak reconstruction in the second critique may be dismissed as irrelevant renders the work essentially valid, essentially a description of something real. It is therefore a great source of instruction and a good compendium or storehouse for the problems of mind. But the work has been much overestimated. It is the product of a confused, though laborious, mind. It contains contradictions not merely incidental, such as any great novel work must retain, since no man can at once remodel his whole vocabulary and opinions but contradictions absolutely fundamental and inexcusable, like that between the transcendental function of intellect and its limited authority, or that between the efficacy of things in themselves and their unknowability. Kant's assumptions and his conclusions, his superstitions and his wisdom, alternate without neutralizing each other. Side note. Incoherences. That experience is a product of two factors is an assumption made by Kant. It rests on a psychological analogy, namely on the fact that organ and stimulus are both necessary to sensation. That experience is the substance of matter of nature, which is a construction in thought, is Kant's conclusion, based on intrinsic logical analysis. Here experience is evidently viewed as something uncaused and without conditions, being itself the source and condition of all thinkable objects. The relation between the transcendental function of experience 
and its empirical causes kant never understood the transcendentalism which if we have it at all must be fundamental he made derivative and the realism which must then be derivative he made absolute therefore his metaphysics remained fabulous and his idealism sceptical or malicious ask what can be meant by conditions of experience and kant's bewildering puzzle solves itself at the word condition like cause is a term that covers a confusion between dialectical and natural connections the conditions of experience in the dialectical sense are the characteristics a thing must have to deserve the name of experience in other words its conditions are its nominal essence if experience be used in a loose sense to mean any given fact or consciousness in general the condition of experience is merely immediacy if it be used as it often is in empirical writers for the shock of sense its conditions are two a sensitive organ and an object capable of stimulating it if finally experience be given its highest and most pregnant import and mean a fund of knowledge gathered by living the condition of experience is intelligence taking the word in this last sense kant showed in a confused but essentially conclusive fashion that only by the application of categories to immediate data could knowledge of an ordered universe arise or in other language that knowledge is a vista that it has a perspective since it is the presence to a given thought of a diffused and articulated landscape the categories are the principles of interpretation by which the flat datum acquires this perspective in thought and becomes representative of a whole system of successive or collateral existences the circumstance that experience in the second sense is a term reserved for what has certain natural conditions namely for the spark flying from the contact of stimulus and organ led kant to shift his point of view and to talk half the time about conditions in the sense of natural causes or needful antecedents intelligence is not an antecedent of thought and knowledge but their character and logical energy synthesis is not a natural but only a dialectical condition of pregnant experience it does not introduce such experience but constitutes it nevertheless the whole skeleton and dialectical mould of experience came to figure in kant's mythology as machinery behind the scenes as a system of non-natural efficient forces as a partner in a marriage the issue of which was human thought the idea could thus suggest itself favoured also by remembering inopportunely the actual psychological situation that all experience in every sense of the word had supernatural antecedents and that the dialectical conditions of experience in the highest sense were efficient conditions of experience in the lowest end of chapter four part two